Welcome back to another episode of Good Things Guy. Today I'm excited to have a very good friend of mine on the show. She has been on the show before, um, but for those of you that might not know, Mandy Wiener and I go way back. I was one of her biggest fans on Twitter, and uh, we're going to talk about the first time I met her now, which was completely embarrassing. Um, I didn't know who she was, even though I followed her, and then she had to sort of tap me on the shoulder and go, I'm oh, Mandy Wiener. You don't even remember that. Mandy, welcome no to the show. I what you're talking about. You don't remember no. that? Okay, so, Mandy Wiener has written plenty of books. She's one of South Africa's best journalists. Uh, she doesn't shy away from anything, and she's also one of my good friends. I cannot believe you don't remember the day we Just met. remind me, refresh my memory. So you and I were both working at the same, um, it was like an expo where we were yes, talking. Yes, I remember that. And, <laughs> no, and I remember that. We both met at, uh, we were being represented by the same management team, and um, Mandy had her little tag on, but it had flipped the other way. So like when you go to an expo, you wear these tags, but yours had flipped, so I didn't even know your name. And you walked up to me at the counter and, hey, and you were like, hey, are you, are you Brent, Brent, Brent Linda Q, the good things guy? And I was like, yeah, 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 that, that's me. Um, and you went, hi, I'm Mandy. And I went, oh, do you work for them? <laughs> and you said, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then I turned around. And as I turned around, your, your little thing flipped. And I was like, that's Mandy Wiener. And then I nearly died. And then amazing. we had a whole conversation about how you were the good things guy and I was the bad things girl. Correct. Right. And when you started your talk, um, see, I remember this. It's, it was one of the greatest moments of my life. When you started your talk, you said, like, Hi, I'm Mandy Wiener, and um, if you want to hear the good news, you're going to have to go to the other stage, because I'm going to talk about the real stuff, was sort of how it started. But Which is pretty much how our relationship has been since. It is, it is. We said, at one point, we're going to do a talk where, I think we called, we, at the time, and we were joking around with names, but we were saying, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. But if it's good, it, it should. should. Yeah, there we go. Um, I mean, it even rolls off the tongue. Mans, how's things going? So since then, um, you now have a real day job where you're in radio mm. every day. Um, 702, how's it going? Yeah, great. Uh, I've been used to not working for years and being my own boss and doing whatever, whatever I wanted, meeting people for coffee and breakfast and things. Um, and now I've got a real job. So I have to actually go into the studio every day and prepare a show and then present a show every day for an hour on breaking news and whatever else is happening. So it's a lot. And um, a book at the same time and kids in lockdown, it's been mad. But you're, you're not new to radio because you've always featured, and I mean, when the big trials were happening all over the country, you were part of the Mandy Wiener reporting from the courthouse in Johannesburg, Gauteng, South Africa, the world, right? You do that so well. <laughs> <laughs> so you've always been in the radio space. Yeah. Yeah. New to you. yeah, I was at EWN as a reporter for sure, like 13, 14 years. So it's very much like coming home for me. Um, it's very familiar being on radio. Like radio is absolutely my first love. So it's, uh, it's so awesome to be back on radio and to be doing a show. Like it's really grown up. It's very adult. I, I do feel like it is a bit adult, a bit out there. Um, another part of your show, uh, which I love, and it's only something I found out on Women's Day, is that you're mostly an all-woman team, right? Yeah, Why the flag? yeah, we have an amazing all-woman team, which doesn't happen often in, in radio. Tama is my producer, she puts the show together. Palesa, DJ Scoobs, is uh, the technical producer who pushes the buttons. So we're, we're all girls, we're all women, and it's awesome to, to have that reflected, and we try and make sure that we amplify women's voices, um, which is very important to us, to make sure that we find uh, female experts in, in things to talk about. So that, that's brilliant to be able to do that. Well, I think it's a fantastic show. Um, with regards to, to now the radio taking up a lot of your time, there was also this thing that was thrown in called COVID. Mm -hmm. So we were all locked away at home. And all of a sudden, you had to become a school teacher as well because you've got two kids that mm -hmm. needed to learn. And, and your hubby then moved in full-time at home as well. So he well, but he did live there full-time. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he didn't, he didn't go to the office anymore. And yeah. I, I think he actually kicked you out of your office Correct. at one That's stage. Right. And, and then you decided to write a book. <laughs> How did you fit all of this in? It was mad. So um, I literally was homeschooling my kids. So we turned their playroom into a school, into a classroom. And I was doing classes all morning on, on Zoom with brilliant teachers. Uh, so it was very difficult. But I had been uh, writing a book anyway. So it was in the pipeline. So I just carried on. And it was actually quite good to have that distraction. It gave me something to focus on. Uh, I, I would homeschool in the morning until like 11, 12. And then I'd focus on the book for a few hours and then spend time with my kids. So it actually gave me a really good distraction and something to keep me busy. 
because otherwise I wouldn't have had anything to keep me busy and I would have gone a little bit more crazy than I already it did. Purpose. It was purpose, exactly. We all went crazy. I fully, like... Running laps of the garden. <laughs> <laughs> we all did something. Uh, baking banana bread. Oh. Um, that was a phase. You wrote about that in mm -hmm. one of your articles. I did. How we How we transitioned from one weird chapter to the next. And it was like yep. the whole country was doing it at the same time. But in between that, you wrote, I think, uh, you wrote, you wrote, I think this is your fourth book. Fifth. Fifth. Fifth book, yes. Fifth. I've only been to one of the book launches, so wouldn't know. Whistleblowers, tell me, what's it about? So the Whistleblowers is about the whistleblowers. Um, so what I've done is looked at various whistleblowers in South Africa over the past decade or two. Uh, and these are people that have decided to speak up, to speak uh, truth to power, who have held people to account, uh, who have really risked everything to come out and make sure that we know about corruption, that people that are you know, responsible for wrongdoing are exposed. And we know these stories, many of them have been reported about with state capture, they've come out of the Zondo Commission, they've been in the media, but for me it's the human element, it's the people behind them, that narrative that I really wanted to capture. It's heroes, it's people that are not afraid heroes. to stand up. And, and this is definitely good news, like this is good things guy stuff, because these people are heroes. They are people that have been brave and courageous, who have taken enormous risks, and we really owe them an enormous uh, debt of gratitude as well. If we talk, so, so you say brave, you say good news, you say heroes, all those great words sound fantastic, but the realism of it is some of these people have put their lives at risk to tell the truth. Well, some of the people I write about have been killed. You know, there's three incidents in the book where people have actually been, been shot and killed for exposing corruption. So I've interviewed their family members. Um, and it's very traumatic to see what people go through. And despite this, like the one example is Jimmy Mokhlala, who was the speaker of the Mbombela municipality, who blew the whistle on corruption relating to the 2010 stadiums. His son, Tsapiso, was with him when he was shot, and Tsapiso was shot in the leg as well. And when I interviewed him about this, he just showed remarkable maturity about how his father had left him a legacy of truth. And even though it is such a dark, depressing story, he has managed to take away from that something so positive and so encouraging that it does give us uh, motivation to, you know, to continue to speak out. As a journalist and someone that cares about their, their craft and what they do, sometimes you might get sucked into it. Um, that it's emotionally taxing on yourself as well. Did you find that with writing this book? This was a very heavy book. It really was. I mean, in the, in the past, I've written about organized crime and police corruption and the underworld, but this was very different. It was very heavy from a human perspective. People have gone through immense trauma. They have PTSD. Their lives have fallen apart. Their marriages have broken down. It's very heavy stuff. And because you're sitting with people on a very personal level and you carry their story and you feel this responsibility to do that story justice, I, I did feel that it was, it, it was heavy. And you get invested in it emotionally as well. Um, so, so it was different this time around. But I also felt that what they had been through doesn't even vaguely compare to what I was going through. So it was irrelevant, really, because you can't compare with what they're doing. And when the book has finally been banned and it's come together and you see your front page, and you see this sitting in front of you, it's number five. It doesn't get any less exciting and cathartic. You, fi you yeah. finally got to the end of this journey. That must, uh, that must be maybe out of the top 10 things in the world that's one of the best things to it's feel. It's pretty phenomenal. Like you never get tired of that feeling of, of seeing a book in print, walking into a bookstore, and seeing the book there is, is just awesome. But it's also a great relief and, and as you say, cathartic. Um, because so much goes into it, then you have that kind of, deflation afterwards as well. But then you have the anxiety about whether or not people will like it and read it, what the reaction will be. Um, so it's, it's always that big bundle of, of different emotions as well. I know for free and for nothing that, the, that there's a group of friends that follow you and love you and they'll buy the book regardless. So you do have, you do have people that will. So don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> whether it's good or not is a different story. They probably won't read it. They'll just <laughs> buy it and say, we're supporting you, but they should read it as well. 
Um, I got invited, luckily, and I'm very thankful for it. It's, it's an honor to, to get invited to anything you do. But I got invited to your last book launch where you actually had gangsters <laughs> that were there and there were, there were security people and it was like, it was hush-hush, but it also wasn't. And it was a cool launch. Like, it was really fun to be in that space. Um, and, and the book lended itself to that. So, mm. so, you know, how then, during COVID, do you launch a book? So it's quite strange. So we're doing a virtual launch, which is weird, but in this new crazy world that we're in, that's how things are done. Um, but we are going to do a real life, actual in-person book launch. So you can come to that one too. I'll Obviously in limited out. numbers and you can't have like wine everywhere. Um, so it's a bit different. But at the same time, I do feel like we should have a real life launch so that the people that I've written about and their families can be honored and celebrated. And I think that will just be a very cool thing to do. Well, I also love about book launches. And I'm not, I, I mean, I read books, but I've never been in that space where you go with all like the zhuzh people that do all the book launches. But there's always um, those moments where they get the author to sit up either on like a little stage or on a little platform and then you just unpack a little bit of the backstory on how you wrote the book or mm. where that inspiration come from came from i need to understand and i know we've spoken about this for years i will one day write a book mm -hmm. when i find the time how do you, you you said that you specifically it was a great breakaway during COVID, but how do you find the time as a writer as a person that needs, needs to report on news this mm. is your job. Like, you're yeah. writing all the time. So how do you then make time to get away from that to write? It's very difficult. So um, also about having the right mindset. So in the past, before I had kids, I could sit all day and write. From the time I woke up to the time I went to bed, you just sit there and write. With kids, you have to find pockets of time. And you kind of start writing a paragraph and then get distracted and then have to come back to it, which is quite hard. So I would find myself either late at night or very early in the morning writing, and then I would have to shut myself away um, for an hour or two and then try and stop them from, from coming in. Um, and it's about getting your head into that space. It's very difficult. Mm. So you write in, in kind of snippets and snatches here and there, which is tough to do with uh, this kind of subject matter as well. But I've had to adapt. You know, some people get to go to writing retreats and get to sit with other writers. In Greece. Go and yeah, sit in Greece. wherever they are, secluded somewhere at writing retreats. That does not happen in the real world. <laughs> like in the real world, I'm literally sitting with Barbie on Netflix with my kid next to me while I'm trying to write and I've got to kind of switch it off. That's, that's how you just deal, you cool. multitask. Talent. Talent, that's what that a is. Survival, survival, really. So d during um, lockdown, you and I caught up quite a bit over Zooms and all sorts. And um, one of the things that you said is that your, your creativity when writing usually comes from like sitting in public spaces, like mm. coffee shops. Yeah. And have you gone back to a coffee shop? Are you, are you getting back into it? Are you so, I mean, I'm getting back into it to coffee shops and, and restaurants, but I'm not going with my laptop to sit at a restaurant and work. That still feels kind of a bit weird for me. Um, but I am getting back into restaurants. I think it's important that we do that to support the industry and just to get some sense of normality. But I actually haven't found myself sitting writing in... Um, so has in your creativity, has your, has your uh, the place that the creativity comes from, have you helped shape it into something else? Now? Yeah, I think so. I think that there has been an adaptation you know, like an evolution of it in, in a way. Maybe I'll go back to that, I'm not sure. But I think it's also because I've got a job now in an office that that's a bit different too. Yep, yep. Okay, I have to ask you. Um, we speak about new normal. I hate the word unprecedented. We throw it around everywhere. It's this word of 2020. And mute. Oh, yeah, 100%. Where, where are we going? Where is COVID going? You are entrenched in the news. Mm. You, you guys are reporting on this every day. Um, is there a good news story there? Uh, I think so. I mean, I think that already there's been a, a good news story and that we are in a much better place than we were. But I, I fully expect there to be a, a second wave. I mean, that is not scientific from my own interpretation. It's just the sense that I get that I think that that's probably going to happen. Um, and people, I think we've checked out and people are definitely just becoming apathetic, which is extremely concerning. 
Um, but obviously we're, we're watchful and for the time being we're distracted and we're focusing on other things from a, a news perspective, but it's kind of lurking there in mm. the shadows. So I, I do fully expect us, maybe we won't go back into lockdown, but I think there'll definitely be... The second wave. The second so wave. I've, I've been, I started quite early in lockdown reporting, I can't say reporting because it was just on Facebook and social media feeds, but I was um, showing off the stats in a different light where I was concentrating on active recoveries cases and recoveries and, yeah. and that was like sort of where I was going. And going after mainstream media. Oh, I apologize mainstream media, but it does happen. Um, what I actually had a great. Do, do you put me into mainstream never, media? Never, never. Oh, okay. You're friend stream media. That's where you live. <laughs> um, but but what's going to happen? And I'm, I wake up every morning fearing it. Is when the second wave comes, and I'll have to like put the numbers out because it is going to happen. I know that's going to happen with everything opening, with mm. people losing their masks when they run. And apathetic is is the word that yeah. you use. That's exactly what's happening. So I think that's something that we all need to be prepared for. When it comes to more on the economic side, I'm, I'm asking not someone as an economist, yeah. but someone who's in the news, will we recover? Do you think in 2021, are people going to start really putting their backs into it and working harder and creating jobs and doing all these good things? Pivot. That's what everyone's talking about, right? Pivoting. Pivot. So, I mean, the reason that I love you so much is because you're so optimistic. And people are always surprised how optimistic I am, considering what I do. Everyone I, thinks I'm that rubbing I'm, off on you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> fully, fully attributed to you. But I'm always optimistic. I always think that we find a way of surviving, um, that, that we will always come through. It's, it's a bit Pollyanna-ish, but I am optimistic. Like, I think that we'll, we'll find a way to survive. But government also needs to, to step in, and mm -hmm. we need to hold government to account. And, and that's why journalism is, is so important important and civil society is so important as well because government needs to you know come up with a proper economic recovery plan there are so many people whose lives have been decimated businesses have just been you know the rest in peace graveyard of of the economy is is growing mm -hmm. and, and that's really worrying so I do think that that people will come through it but government needs to to step in yeah. and and we need to see some kind of of lifeline for people the last time I had you in studio we spoke it was actually the your last book, I think. We yes. chatted about your book, and, and I said exactly the same thing that I'm going to say now. We've just closed this book. It's being sold. It's out there. <laughs> Have you started no. writing your next one? <laughs> you, know, you said no is last it, time. Is it on the record or off the record? Off the record. No. Don't, don't tell anyone. So every time I finish a book, I always say, I'm never going to do this again, because it is such an enormous investment of time and energy and I always just think oh I can't do this again and I'm going to take a break but then I look back on the last 10 years and there's this pattern which has developed where even my son said to me this morning so mom you're going to do another book in two years then and I was like no why would you say that and I have no intention at this point okay. I certainly won't do such a big book again this was really a bit ambitious so I think I'll, I'll look for something. I don't know. Mem memoirs through COVID. It, it could Please happen. no. It could happen. <laughs> Please no. Mandy, thank you so much for joining me again on, on The Good Things Guy. I must ask um, mm -hmm. if people want to follow you, if they want to hear from you. You are very... All the bad news, for, well, right? I, sometimes you share really good stuff as well. I, I've seen them and I love it. And sometimes if you find a nugget that you like, Brenty, this is for you, you'll send it to me and be like, you have to, this is good, which I love. Um, but... But you are, are very relevant. Your stuff is, is incredibly newsworthy. And at the end of the day, it's free because it's on social media. Mm. And you're, you're very, very vocal in those spaces. If people want to follow you, where do they go? So on Twitter, my handle is at Mandy Wiener, M-A-N-D-Y-W-R-E-N-E-R. -E -E and then I've got a Facebook page as well. Um, and it's, you'll find me if you just search for Mandy Wiener. Um, I'm not so active on Insta, but I'm, I'm there. Um, and then people can buy the book. Buy the book. Buy the book. That's all you got to do. Mandy Wiener, we love her. Um, journalism is so important. We need to hold our government accountable. These are all of the things that we've spoken about. Buy the book. Please support <laughs> my friend. Um, but more than anything, be kind. Done. Be kind. Be kind.